Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Nathan Hill. I'm the marketing director here at Next After. Now, today we've got a really cool webinar. Uh, pretty much, I think it's the first webinar this year where we've actually been able to preview some brand new research. And today's research is brought to you uh, by Network for Good. They've partnered with us on this, this study. Brady's going to share more about that. Uh, we've got someone from, Net from Network for Good who's going to share more about you know what services they offer and how you can engage with them too. But uh, I'm just so thankful that you're spending an hour with us today to you know, learn more about how you can grow, because I think that's so important, especially at a time like this. Now, before we jump in, uh, I do have a few housekeeping items that I do want to share. Number one, the most popular question is, will there be a recording? And the answer is yes. After this, around like 5 p.m. Central Time today, I'll send you a video, but I'll also send you uh, some links to any additional resources that we mentioned today, as well as a link to get the slides. So you can look back at those, you can share those with other people if you want to. And then number three, we will have time today for some Q&A. So if you use that same chat box that's on the right side of your screen that you've been seeing, uh, you can put your ideas, your thoughts, your commentary, your questions in there all throughout the webinar. And then at the very end, we'll circle back and we'll have some live Q&A time. So again, if anything pops into your brain as Brady's going through his presentation today, shares a, a data point that you wanna dive deeper into or a question about a strategy or a tactic, just put that in the q and I'll watch for those, I'll collect all those questions and then we'll come back to those at the very end. One more thing I do wanna make sure you know about is this virtual workshop we have coming up tomorrow. This is a online certification workshop. Typically we do these types of workshops in person at our office or at various cities around uh, North America. But given the circumstances, we're taking this online. So tomorrow, if you're interested, you can actually spend basically the day with Brady and I, where we're going to go through this course, Intro to Online Fundraising Optimization. Uh, and you can knock out the whole course in one day. So at the very end, there will be an exam where you can actually get certified. And we're going to talk about a bunch of core foundational principles related to optimization, specifically how to improve your email fundraising, how to improve your donation pages, and how to start A-B testing within your website, within your emails, within your fundraising to really learn what works to grow generosity. You can check out more about that, nextafter.com slash virtual dash workshop. You see that link on your screen here. Uh, it does have a cost, it's $1.99 per person. Um, you can check that out and see if that's uh, interesting to you at the link. Now, let me introduce Brady, who uh, is a brand new Texan. Uh, cue the uh, Texas cowboy ad here. Uh, Brady is the managing director of the Next After Institute. He just moved from Vancouver to Texas a few days ago. So this is brand new to him, uh, which is a ton of fun. Uh, Brady is amazing. He has so much insight into philanthropy and giving and generosity and optimization and testing and digital marketing. Uh, and he's kind of at the forefront of some of the research that we're conducting here at Next After, trying to figure out really what are we, people doing out in the marketplace to increase generosity. So I won't say anything or anything more than that. I'll hand it over to Brady. Brady, you want to tell us about the research that we're looking at today? You bet. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Nathan, for that uh, introduction. And we are sharing some brand new research, never before seen. Nathan hasn't even seen this. Uh, Kimberly from Network for Good, who's partnered with us, she hasn't seen this. So you guys are some of the first to see uh, this research. And I'm just gonna dive right in, but I'm just gonna say first, this was a big, big challenge. So I'm gonna unpack kind of what we went through and, and some of the key findings. But in summary, we, we had data, both survey data and hard data. So like actual fundraising data from over 2,700 small nonprofits. And so trying to find a way to like synthesize this data and make it useful is actually really, really difficult. Uh, particularly if we wanted to be something that's useful. Sometimes I think we get benchmark studies or something comes out and it's like, you know, so what, you know, what do I do with this? And so that's one of the big challenges that we're wrestling with through this pro uh, program, um, process. Um, another challenge is kind of uh, data integrity for lack of a better word. So uh, this is a problem in our whole entire space. So when we look at how do we analyze online giving, often the best way is through something called e-commerce, which integrates with Google Analytics so that you can get the online giving data right there in your Google Analytics, where it's coming from, dates, times, et cetera. And you don't have to rely necessarily on your CRM to run reports and things like that. But very few organizations actually have this set up. It's about 10 to 20% from what we've seen total, let alone small nonprofits who often have different systems and less uh, technology capabilities and things like that. So we actually wanted to include more of this uh, Google Analytics data. We offered nonprofits the chance to sign up and connect their Google Analytics, but not one small nonprofit that did that 
actually had e-commerce set up, which is not atypical, but that was a big challenge of how do we rectify what's in a CRM versus what's going on on the web and kind of stitch these data sources together. So that was a challenge. Uh, this is an obvious one, but COVID-19, it affects us and me, just like I'm sure it affects you, you know, timelines and schedules and all this kind of stuff. Um, it, it's, it's, it's a challenge, right? I'm sure it's a challenge for you. It's been a challenge for me. And it was a challenge to do this research as well during this time. And then as Nathan, Nathan mentioned, also did this. <laughs> uh, my dog, uh, my cat, my two-year-old son turned to yesterday, my wife, we drove from Pitt Meadows through Bainbridge, Boise, Winter Park, and then accidentally Boise City, Oklahoma, to make our way to McKinney uh, last week. So it's been a, a very interesting time in our lives as well. So all this to say, we were hoping to have the full report, but this is just going to be like a teaser report. And so we're going to share some of the early things, kind of a rough draft, so to speak. And if you could do me one favor, and I'll spell this properly now that I'm south of the border, could you do me a favor? Uh, could you give some feedback? Uh, there'll be a time where you can uh, let us know how you what you thought about the webinar, but that's my email. If you've got thoughts on, hey, this was useful, this sucked, this is how this could be more beneficial to me and my colleagues, I would love to love to know because we will take that feedback and we will make sure that that gets into the final report. So thank you in advance if you participated in the survey. Thank you so much if you're Network for Good client, you participated perhaps without knowing. Thank you to Network for Good for partnering with us on this. So Carrie and Kimberly, Olivia, Alicia, Mike, Tom, Amanda, and many, many more people, thank you so much for your work. Um, ben Cipollini was our data scientist on this project. Um, he's at Facebook now, he used to be at Classy, so big thanks to Ben. And big thanks to Nathan as well for helping put some of this together. We're on the marketing side of things. So let's, uh, let's get into it. So here's, here's the need, right? Uh, when you're in the world of online fundraising in particular, but fundraising, and you're trying to figure out metrics and data, it can just kind of be like a bunch of numbers flying around the window and it can be very frustrating and you don't really know what to do. And perhaps particularly so if you work for a small nonprofit, or at least that's my experience. Uh, my very first job, I was the director of development at a startup nonprofit. I was the first and only full-time employee. We had a budget of about $300,000. They said, you know, we can pay you for about nine months, but after that, it's up to you. And uh, a lot of what I just learned at grad school was kind of completely irrelevant. And a lot of the places that I was trying to find out, like, am I doing a good job and what do I do, weren't super relative to me in a very, very small shop of one person. And so these questions that everyone's trying to figure out is like, how am I doing and how do I compare are actually really difficult for small nonprofits to answer because we'll often go out and see different data sources or even if they have small examples or small charities or small nonprofits, there's a big variance in small, something that we'll talk about. And so that's one of the things that I think we and Network for Good in this case are existing to do or trying to do is shed some more light so small nonprofits can know how am I actually doing and how do I actually compare. Or, uh, earlier this year with COVID-19, the coronavirus crisis, we put together this page to actually help answer that question is like, what's just going on? How do you compare? Try, try to provide some data and some evidence, shed some light on what organizations are doing. And so that was our approach here as well is what are small nonprofits doing? And we really wanna keep it simple. Um, and, and our methodology, if you've taken any of our courses or any of our workshops, we really try to focus on these three key metrics, traffic, conversion rate, and average gift. How many people show up to your website? How many people actually say yes in terms of making a donation? And then average gift, how generous are they? How do they, do they say heck yes? And if you multiply those three metrics together, you get revenue, which is really what we're trying to do. Now, this model is really what we use for online fundraising, but you can apply it to events. How do you get more people to show up, more people who show up to say yes, and more people who say yes to say heck yes, right? More volume, more action, and more generosity. Those are the three different variables. And so just by looking at these three things, you can get a pretty quick sense of how you're doing and how you compare. So that's really what our approach is and the need that we're trying to fulfill. But as I kind of alluded to, here's the problem. This is a real organization that I did a data audit with earlier this year small nonprofit. And so we tried to compare these key metrics, traffic, conversion rate, average gift, and, uh, and then to get revenue compared to our benchmark. So we have a series of clients and other nonprofits who share their data with us as a benchmark, but you'll see like donor conversion rate, they had a 1,669% better conversion rate than the benchmark or 180% increase in average gift. But if you look at things like traffic, the benchmark was 530,000 visits a month, and this organization was getting 1,200. So there's a huge discrepancy in this benchmark. So is this really a useful benchmarking tool? And I'd say no. So luckily, we were able to actually uh, benchmark this organization based on traffic. 
So it started to get a little bit better. You can see that the traffic is close to the benchmark, but now the conversion rate, which was amazing and astronomical is just better. And average gift is actually worse now. And then because we work with a, a decent amount of Christian ministries, we're able to do a, a subset of a subset. And now this is really comparing them to their peers. And this is more of the ideal of what we and uh, would like to get to and are hopefully going to make progress towards again with Network for Good so that this type of benchmarking will be possible for small nonprofits. So kind of moving away from this, comparing to large organizations and more to your peers is what we're trying to do and make progress towards that. There are some other great benchmarks, uh, a couple that I've used in the past and, and use frequently. Uh, Blackwell's Charitable Giving Report, they do mention small nonprofits in there. Fundraising Effectiveness Project, donor centrics around sustainers, and probably the best one when it comes to digital metrics and online fundraising is the MNR benchmark. They just came out with theirs about a month ago. And it's, it's a great, very rich data source, 200 and some organizations, they do a great job. But even them, they use a small segment. So you can uh, look by size and vertical. And for, for them, the small vertical is about $500,000 in online revenue or less. So that's half a million dollars in online revenue or less is considered small. And you might be saying to yourself, that's not small. In this study, for example, the median total revenues was about $300,000. So this is what I mean by the big variance, even within the world of small. So what we were trying to do here with Network for Good is saying, well, can we fill this void? Can we actually come up with a new benchmark that to my knowledge has never been done around key fundraising metrics specific to small nonprofits and really only nonprofits. We will do some compare and contrast to large organizations, but really trying to make this uh, progress towards this benchmarking to see how small nonprofits specifically can compare to their peers. So that's the idea. That's what we were trying to do. And again, hopefully this is kind of year one and we'll be able to do this and improve upon it in different years. So here's what we did. Um, we wanted to look at two different data sources or kind of answer two different questions. The first one is how are small nonprofits feeling? Uh, we focus a lot on data here. We'll share a lot of different data and research, but how organizations feel or more anecdotal evidence is still a valuable source of data. If an organization feels a certain way or if they're doing certain things, even if it's not hard data, there's still some value in this. So we wanted to capture that primarily through a survey. But then we also wanted to back up with, well, what actually are nonprofits doing? Uh, what are they actually doing to raise money? Or more so, um, what does it look like within their CRM, within their database to raise money? Not just online, but in total. So on the survey side, we ended up getting survey responses from over 1,200 different people. And the vast majority of those, three quarters, 926, were from small nonprofits. So we're defining small as less than a million dollars in total revenue, less than a million dollars in total revenue, or a million dollar budget or less. That's what we're saying considered was a small nonprofit. Anything bigger than that was considered a big nonprofit. So it was binary. You were either small or you were big. Uh, we collected these responses in early February to early March. So before really COVID-19 really struck. So we asked a lot about kind of what were your goals for 2020 and how are you feeling? And we actually didn't spend a lot of time doing an analysis on those, thinking that, you know, a lot of our plans that we had in January are kind of out the window. We're in a different world, different reality. So we spent most of our time focusing on, well, what's a good baseline? What are some of the opportunities for organizations to focus on? And again, small is defined as a million dollars and less in total revenue. And then on Network for Good side, they were so generous. They shared uh, uh, actual giving data from 2,800 Network for Good customers. Um, the vast majority of those, 1,865, were small, again, so less than a million dollars total revenue. When I talk about um, data in years, uh, we're looking at January through December, or calendar year. And we looked at organizations that had at least one donation in 2017, 2018, and 2019. This is important when we look at different trends or when we want to look at laps or recovered donors, you have to have at least three years. So we wanted to go back three years with the same organizations that we had some data for. So Network for Good has more clients than this. The lights just turned off in here. There we go. I got to move around a little bit to make sure that they're on. Um, and, but this is the subset that we use within the, the data that was shared. And then we matched up the organizations with IRS available data. And so the small, uh, the median organization that we received from Network for Good was between 100,000 and 500,000. So it's about 300,000. So that's what we were using for the data sources on, on the small nonprofit side. But as you can see, we, we did collect some information from big nonprofits. We had almost 300 people who worked for a big nonprofit in our survey and almost 1,000 customers from, Next, uh, from Network for Good, sorry. 
that were considered big. So we will use a little bit of compare and contrast because while we want to benchmark you against your peers, it is a useful foil as well to just kind of see, well, what are larger organizations doing and how does that apply to us or not? So that's really just kind of setting the stage uh, for today. I have a weird like red, red hue. Feels like I'm in uh, like a 7-Eleven, you know, the hot dogs under the stands. I feel like I'm under one of those. So anyways, just bear with me. So here's where we want to go today. Uh, the agenda, I'm going to share a little bit more about where the data is coming from, particularly who took the survey. I think that's really important. Anytime we get data, we need to understand its integrity or where is it coming from so that we know and can contextualize the data that we're seeing. I'll provide a quick small uh, snapshot of small nonprofits and their current fundraising, and then want to spend more time sharing some of these key findings with a focus on how small nonprofits can actually improve their fundraising. Uh, there, if we have time, I'll share a couple additional benchmarks and data points, which might be interesting or useful. And then we should have a lot of time for questions and discussions. And this is where we can get into more of the like, well, what do I do and how do I fundraise? And this is where Kimberly in particular will be great. So Kimberly helps lead up a lot of the strategy and service at Net for Good and deals with small nonprofits all the time. So she's here and available to answer a lot of your questions. So there should be a lot of time for that. And just last kind of setup here before we really get into it, a few caveats. Um, unless I say otherwise, I'm always talking about small nonprofits. So I'm not going to say, you know, small nonprofits or big nonprofits. If I'm just talking about nonprofits, I'm talking about small nonprofits, less than a million dollars total revenue. Um, one thing that really kind of um, irks me, I feel this way about when people think kind of like nonprofit is inherently bad and like for profit is inherently good. Um, that's not true, although that sentiment tends to exist. I think there's an element of that for small nonprofits as well. Just because you're a small nonprofit does not mean that you're not a good nonprofit or that you don't know what you're doing or that you're not having success or that you're not having an impact. That is not what I am saying at all. So if any of this comes across kind of, you know, judgmental, that's really not it at all. What I'm trying to say is based on data and what we know about online fundraising in particular, but fundraising overall, here's where small nonprofits can and need to improve. Our goal is how do we optimize fundraising. But just because an organization is small does not mean that they're bad. And big does not mean good. Okay. Let's just get that out of the way. Uh, some of these key findings may seem repetitive or some of the suggestions like, oh yeah, I've heard that. Well, part of the challenge is this is why it's useful to do these studies of saying, yeah, donor retention, for example, is something that our sector in space has been talking about as long as I've been in it, 15 plus years, about how poor the donor retention rate is. And yet it continues to be about the exact same so we still need to continue talking about donor retention because whatever we're doing isn't working. And that's a hugely, hugely critical piece of fundraising. So there may be some of that here where you go, oh, I've heard that already. Well, before we move on to like cool, new, fancy things, we have to be doing some of these basics and some of that bears repetition until we can actually make some change. And then uh, we're focused a lot on online in particular, but also direct response. So we do talk about direct mail. So just a, a, you know, a note, if you're looking for, well, what do we do for grants or what do we do for major gifts? Uh, I'm happy to give them my opinion. Kimberly probably has more experience than I do, so she can weigh in. Our focus is really on you know, the donor who gives $1,000 or less, primarily through the mail or even more so online. That's where we're focused in terms of this benchmark and the work that we're doing. All right, so the caveats aside, let's get into it. Uh, where's this data coming from? Again, I think it's important to know where this data is coming from. So in terms of who took the survey, you can see all the people that uh, work for an organization under a million dollars. But within that, 66% of the people who responded to our survey work for organizations with a budget of less than $300,000. So this is, again, really important to note. Two-thirds of the people, of the responses that you'll see, work for organizations who raise less than $300,000. Again, small doesn't mean bad. Small just means small. So keep that in mind when you're thinking about some of these responses. And maybe you yourself work for an organization that raises money in that range. Well, then great. The majority of responses will be your peers. And when we look at who actually took the survey, we found that uh, in terms of a role, almost half were executives, which makes sense. If it's an organization that's $300,000 or less, you're not going to have 10, 12 staff, right? You're going to have one, maybe two, maybe a part-time. You're going to have fewer people that work for you. So the vast majority of people that took this um, survey were actually executives at the nonprofit. There was a kind of, we saw some practitioners, so people actually running uh, online fundraising, a few board members, uh, and some um, uh, some managers in there as well, but the majority, again, were executives. And again, this, this makes sense when we look at how many full-time equivalents or FTEs were there. 
62% of people worked for an organization that had less than two full-time equivalent staff. So again, the vast majority of organizations are, you know, 62% here are working for organizations that have less than two staff. So once we get into like the, how do you fundraise? So it's great, we have these ideas, but how unlimited capacities, always, always, always a question. So hopefully the data can help inform where you should focus your time. And then particularly in questions and other resources, we can talk about what, uh, how you can actually go about doing that. So we also asked, <clears throat> how long have you been in the role? And what's interesting is 54% of people were in their role from one to five years. And we expand new, to new people as well. 80% of people have been there less than five years. So again, this isn't that shocking or that you know, new information necessarily. There's a lot of turnover in our industry, particularly around fundraisers and small nonprofits. A lot of small nonprofits are new themselves. So there's a lot of uh, what we take from this is there's a lot of new-ish people in their roles uh, that are providing these responses. And we look at the different types of organizations. We ask people to self-select which vertical they were in. And you can see that not all verticals are equally represented. So we were unable to do a really good kind of vertical analysis because there was very, very few of one and a lot of another. So then it's not really fair or even or equal. So just kind of wanted to get this and show you that there's a lot of human services, education, arts, faith-based, and very few public media, public policy organizations and foundations. So again, this isn't an equal representative sample of the nonprofit space. This is who uh, took our survey. Uh, so on the survey data, some of the methodology is sometimes people said like, you know, uh, they accidentally pushed zero like six times. And so instead of the average gift being 100, it was like 10,000. Uh, we would remove that outlier, um, not from the whole survey, but just from that response. So when you really get into this, the number of responses on questions will vary. So while we had 1,200 people overall, some questions we had as few as 270 because they didn't have the information, they didn't have um, the proper response, and, is, and then some organizations we had 100% completion rate. So when it was an outlier, there was a blank or something like that, we would just remove them from that question, but we kept them in the whole survey. And then again, just survey, this is self-reported data. These are people saying this is what we're doing, this is what we're seeing. There's no way for us to actually validate whether that's true or not, which is why we wanted to have the fundraising data. So these are organizations that use Network for Good as a CRM. They could have uh, other revenue sources, and we found that not all of the revenue all the time is getting tracked in Network for Good for all the clients. So that was uh, part of the, the trick in looking at a holistic picture. Um, again, they received one donation 2017, 18, and 19. And uh, this is again kind of diving into the weeds a little bit, but we really focused a lot on median or middle values, right? You can often take the median or the average. The challenge with average is the high values can really skew the average up. So we focused a lot on the median or the middle number or organization. Uh, and we also did it on a per organization basis. So instead of aggregating all the data that we got for Network for Good to calculate average gift, we would calculate the average gift for each organization, and then we would take the median average gift for uh, the data that we'll show you. So we took kind of the median of the median of sorts, the median of the, of the mean. Okay, so that's uh, what's, what's going on into this report. So what, what's the snapshot of small nonprofit fundraising? What's a glimpse into how nonprofits particularly are feeling? Well, they don't feel like they're being successful is the short answer. So we asked a series of questions about kind of their current strategies and how do you feel about this? So how would you rate the success of digital fundraising? And it was successful, very successful or not successful. And you can see here that 39% of small nonprofits thought their digital fundraising was successful or the other way around, uh, um, 69, 61% um, thought that their fundraising wasn't successful. Um, did I get that correct? Yeah, 39% said their fundraising wasn't successful. Uh, 60% um, on the small side, right? So 61% thought it wasn't successful. Sorry about that. There we go. The majority, 61% said we're not succeeding. And again, compare that to maybe large organizations. We asked the same thing about direct mail. And we found that only 33% of small nonprofits thought their direct mail was successful. Whereas big nonprofits were more like 64%. So small nonprofits don't feel like their online fundraising is working. They don't really feel like their direct mail is working. Well, what about year end? Big nonprofits were twice as likely to say they had a successful year end campaign. 
Uh, and again, the only 38% of small nonprofits thought their year-end fundraising was successful. So again, this kind of 40% range, and it could be the same organization saying, we're not good at this, we're not good at this, we're not good at this. And again, we're not saying what success is, we're just saying, how do you feel? And the overwhelming response, whether it was Giving Tuesday or year-end or online or offline, was organizations, small nonprofits don't feel like they're having a lot of success. So over half didn't participate in Giving Tuesday, but even the ones that did, they didn't feel like they were being very successful. So pretty much every question that we asked, online, offline, year-end, Giving Tuesday, small nonprofits felt like they weren't being very successful. However they define success, they weren't feeling like they were succeeding. So when we talk about online fundraising in particular, we asked like, what's your level of expertise? You know, how comfortable are you? What, what kind of experience level do you have? And we found that people working at small nonprofits were, were more likely to be beginners or self-identify as beginners. So we said, are you a beginner, intermediate, expert, or have no experience? And 50% of small nonprofits um, said they were beginner when it came to online fundraising. So they're not having a lot of success or they don't feel like they're having a lot of success. And when it comes to online, they feel like they're kind of beginners. To compound that problem, small nonprofits don't get as much professional development investment as other organizations. And again, this probably makes intuitive sense, but it bore out in our survey data as well. And we looked at what's your approximate professional development budget range. We found that the biggest difference actually was that um, big nonprofits uh, were five times more likely to have a professional development budget, period. Uh, there was a lot more zeros for small nonprofits. The actual amounts, if you kind of, if I go back here, weren't that far off necessarily. Uh, the, the average small nonprofit spends about 500 bucks per person. The median big nonprofit spends about a thousand bucks per person. So on the median side, it's, you know, $500 is not nothing, but it's close-ish. The biggest thing was how many small nonprofits had zero professional development at all. So we're not feeling successful. We kind of feel like beginners. We don't have a lot of professional development or as much professional development. So in one level, it's not that surprising when we look at the overall online fundraising benchmark to see that small nonprofits usually aren't raising a significant amount of money. So again, if we go back to the key metrics, traffic conversion rate average gift, and we look at revenue from what we saw um, based on the Network for Good data, the average small nonprofit raised $4,100 online. So if you're kind of wondering, you know, how am I doing? I'm a small nonprofit. We raised about $300,000. How much of that comes in online from the data that we have? This is, this is how much of that kind of small nonprofit would raise online, which is not, you know, not a significant amount of money. So kind of the, the quick snapshot of how not small nonprofits are feeling around fundraising and online is not really succeeding, not a lot of expertise, smaller professional development budgets, and not raising a lot of money online. Now that can sound kind of bleak. Uh, and, you know, again, I've been in that seat. There is an element of, of bleakness where there's an, any number of needs, any number of opportunities in such limited time and resources, it can be a little bit bleak. But there's some positive things that we saw as well. So when we looked at 2019 overall, again, this is real data from real small nonprofits. And again, the median, uh, so when I say average, I'm really talking about the median. Um, the small nonprofit had 104 donors. They received about 13% of their revenue was recurring. 54% uh, of it came in online, actually, which is interesting. And again, we're, we're comparing survey data and benchmark data, and they don't always line up, which is partly what we wanted to see. And donor retention is 49%, which is actually a little higher than the kind of industry average. When we compare 2019 to 2018, this was a bit of a negative. Uh, number of donors actually went down 15%, but a big increase in recurring giving we're seeing for small nonprofits, a big increase in the amount of online revenue coming into small nonprofits and a small increase in donor retention. So these are actually really positive things when we look at 2019 compared to 2018. Now 2020 will be really interesting if we do this study again next year, there's gonna be you know big old stars and caveats about COVID-19 and what this means. But at least from what we saw in 2019, there's some good trends here in terms of recurring online and retention. So that's kind of a quick snapshot with online fundraising for small nonprofits, sorry, fundraising for small nonprofits, again, with a focus on, on uh, online. So that's kind of like what went into the study, uh, some, some quick snapshot of where they're at. Let's get into more of the data and kind of what are some key findings and really how do we use those to figure out how small nonprofits can improve their fundraising. So key insight one, small nonprofits don't generate a lot of traffic to their websites. So again, when we look at this, you know, the average small nonprofit raised $4,100 online. The question is, well, why? 
and this is what's great about these three key metrics is you can kind of look at them all and see which one is underperforming or which one's carrying the weight or not. And so when we look at those three key metrics, and this is self-reported data, you can see I've tried to flag it when it's reported or real. Uh, this is for 2019 and a full year. Uh, the average nonprofit, small nonprofit, received 2,000 visits to its website. It's about 168 visits a month. That's not a lot of traffic. 1.8% uh, conversion rate. So the number of people who visit the website who make a donation, they received 37 gifts. So that's just three gifts a month. And the average gift was $110.81. So this is, again, if you're a small nonprofit, maybe these are some key metrics for you when looking at online fundraising to see how do you compare to some of your peers. So when it comes to traffic, now I'm going to compare them to the big nonprofits that we had. Uh, and again, look at the minus 2,036% traffic. And some of these numbers are actually smaller and some of them are bigger. So for example, conversion rates actually higher for small nonprofits. It's one of the things that we often see. If you have a smaller list, a smaller pool, they're generally more committed, more likely to give. You actually have a higher conversion rate. We'll often also see a higher average gift for small nonprofits, although we didn't in this case. It's not that far away. A huge difference in gifts, but the biggest difference by far and away is traffic. The ability for large nonprofits to generate traffic is, is hugely significant. Again, 168 visits to a website, that's not a lot. So how do you actually get traffic? I'm not gonna go all the way into how you get traffic. We've got courses, Network for Good has tools and strategies, but on a, on a high level, you can either earn it. So this is like search, organic search. Uh, maybe you're mentioned in the media or it's kind of direct traffic. So people hear about you or hear from a friend, they go online, type in your URL. Um, you can generate your own traffic via email, something we'll talk about. And social is a way that you kind of earn traffic through your followers and content and things like that. Or you can buy it, right? You can buy search traffic. You can pay for earned media or you can pay for media. You can buy email lists through list swaps and rentals. Or maybe you can do paid media like paid Facebook ads, for example, to buy traffic, ideally to acquire an email. So you can kind of earn it or buy it. And we asked a couple of questions on the buying side of things, which we we're interested to try to figure out. And we found the average small nonprofit spends $1,000 on online advertising in a year. So again, if you're thinking, you know, how much should we, we're not saying this is a good number or a bad number. I think this number should be higher personally, but what we are saying is this is what the average small nonprofit is spending, or they're saying they're spending on online advertising, $1,000, right? So, you know, not a significant amount, it's less than $100 a month. It's pretty difficult to generate any significant volume or benefit with a pretty small investment. And then on the other side, if you may have heard of something called the Google Ad Grant, which is a free program where you can access search advertising. We found that only 10% of small nonprofits actually have the Google Ad Grant. So potentially that's an opportunity for small nonprofits to get it. Now you've got this whole question of managing it, which is a different story, different question, but nine out of 10 organizations are not taking advantage of this. It was interesting, only 25% of big nonprofits are taking advantage of this. So it seems like the Google Ad Grant still, even though we've been talking about it, it's been around forever, there's a lot of organizations that are not taking advantage of it. So in, in general, uh, small nonprofits are not generating a lot of traffic and they're not investing a lot on the paid uh, side of traffic generation. So that was one key insight. We'll talk about some of the things you can do afterwards, but this is just kind of key insights. A small nonprofit send fewer emails to fewer people. We asked, how large is your email list? So how many people are on your main email list? And we found that 60% of small nonprofits have less than a thousand emails on their list. So less than a thousand emails again is you know, relatively small. Uh, it's difficult to really drive revenues when you have a small email list. But then we also asked, how often do you email your list? And 82% uh, of small nonprofits either uh, didn't know or email their list less than once per month. So we asked, how many emails do you have and how many emails do you send? And why is this so important? Well, when we've done all of our data and research and when we work with clients and we try to optimize and improve fundraising, one thing that's generally true is the more good emails you send, to the more engaged people, the more money you'll raise online. For us right now, this is where we spend a lot of our time. If you take our courses, if you talk to our clients, we spend a lot of time getting and sending emails because this is where a lot of the online revenue comes from. It's not just us saying this. Uh, we actually took some real data from real organizations, not small organizations, unfortunately. Uh, again, this was the Google Analytics plugin I talked about earlier where uh, we had zero small, but we actually had about 48, close to 50 uh, large nonprofits. And we look at where does their revenue come from? This is what we see. And we've seen this every year we've been looking at this is this is the number of gifts and emails, the number one source of online gifts. 
and we will look at conversion rate. If we can map that in over top, you can see that email is the highest converting channel as well, just over 3%. So it drives a lot of conversion because you're doing a direct kind of communication and it generates a lot of gifts and generates a lot of revenue. So sending and getting emails is crucially important. And oh yeah, by the way, it's also a great way to drive traffic to your website. So that same benchmark of just about 50 large nonprofits, email was the main driver of website traffic. So emails help you get more donations and send more traffic to your email. It's a critical, critical strategy and channel. And what we see with small nonprofits is they're not sending a lot of email and they're not sending it to a large amount of people. So again, that's probably a big opportunity and something we'll talk more about. So this was an interesting one, something that we're doing a lot more, uh, even though we're like online fundraising and we're digital first, there's still big value in having offline strategies and, and how do you optimize the mail and offline channels. So we looked at that as well in this, in this uh, study and we found that a multi-channel strategy is almost non-existent for small nonprofits. So this was the main question that we asked and this was a tough one for us to figure out. We went back and forth with the Network for Good team of like, how do we phrase this question to kind of get at what we want? So here's where we ended up. Do you take a multi-channel approach with direct mail donors, meaning you communicate to both online and offline donors and other channels? So then here were the options. One, no, we just don't do it. Two, yes, we send email communication to direct mail donors and direct mail donors, uh, direct mail to online donors. So both different types of donors get communication in both channels. Or then, yes, we send email to direct mail donors, but not the other way around. And then the opposite of that. Yes, we send direct mail to online donors, but not the other way around. Or I don't know. So those were the options that we were trying to figure out. Do you take a multi-channel approach or strategy? And here's what we saw. This is kind of a, an interesting one. First off, 55% of small nonprofits don't have a multi-channel approach at all. Just right out of the gate, no, don't do it. Maybe it's don't know how, maybe it's capacity, we don't know. But over half just have no multi-channel approach at all. So what? Why are we talking about multi-channel? Who cares? Well, here's why it's so important. Again, when we can aggregate um, data from a lot of our clients, again, not small up there in the corner saying, not small. I wish we had this data. We wanted to get this data, uh, but we couldn't actually get this data. So, but what we see from clients when we aggregate them is look at how valuable multi-channel, so people who give online and offline, there were 234% more than online only and 210% more than offline only. So you don't need to be you know, a wizard strategist to see this type of data and say, how do we get more offline people giving online and more online people giving offline? This is partly why a multi-channel approach is so incredibly valuable. And yet small nonprofits, half of them aren't doing it at all. So again, maybe that's an opportunity. And then if we look at, okay, yes, uh, we send email communication to direct mail donors. Only 17% of small nonprofits are doing this. So again, so what? Who cares? Well, if we look back at this chart, we can actually call out, look at this difference. People who only give offline, they only write checks offline, just by having an email on files, they may not even read or click an email. But we found that just by having an email, they're worth up to 84% more than those who don't have an email. So again, if you're writing down strategies, which isn't the main focus of this, but it should be like, how do we send email to direct mail donors? Because look at how much more valuable they are. Again, only 17% of nonprofits, small nonprofits are doing that. Well, what about the other way around? What about sending direct mail to online donors? And this is the one that often people are like, what that they gave online, why would we send them mail? Now there's a whole conversation about, you know, preferences and benefits and choice and things like that. But again, so what? Well, what do we know? When we look at the likelihood of someone to become that high value multi-channel donor, this is just one organization, but we see this as a common pattern for our clients. Again, not a small client. Um, but when you look at, do they give offline to then become multi-channel? If they started offline, it's left at less than a half percent. Well, if they have an email, it goes all the way up to 2.15%. Well, that makes sense because they're getting emails. So they're more likely to give online. And what if they give online? Look at that 9.32% chance that they actually uh, became a multi-channel donor, an 1,883% increase in multi-channel conversion rate. That's because when you give online, you must provide an address, right? It's part of the, the billing process. So you get an address anytime someone gives online. Now, is it the right address? Is it the best address? It's a different question. I'm in the dark again. Maybe I'll just stay in the dark instead of under the 7-Eleven light. Um, but when you give offline, you do not have to give your email, right? So just on what you have access to in terms of information is dramatically different. 
but there's a big opportunity of actually sending offline letters, mail, packages, et cetera, to online donors, uh, something that very, very, very few small nonprofits said that they were doing. And so then in the end, there was uh, big nonprofits were two times more likely to have a kind of quote unquote full multi-channel approach where they're saying uh, yes to both online and offline communications to each. So um, this is one of the really interesting things to see this big discrepancy and also seeing this other data that, that backs up. So large nonprofits say they're doing this. And this is why I mentioned, or so they say, it's because we're actually doing a study right now, a different partner, where we actually made online and offline donations and we're tracking the experience of the online and offline donor to see what are nonprofits doing. So we made 120 donations at the end of March. And after three weeks, it's been longer than that, but after three weeks I checked and 101 of the checks have been cashed, but only 14 organizations had sent us an email and we explicitly asked to be sent email communication. So they say they're doing this multi-channel approach, but are they really? So big opportunity, something that big nonprofits say they're doing at least as opposed to small nonprofits. But we also see the same kind of volume problem with email that we, that we saw with email also exists for direct mail. 68% of small nonprofits, less than a thousand people on their list. And 89% of small nonprofits uh, don't know how often they send or send less than twice a year. So if we look at you know, online, offline, and I know there's phone and other ways to communicate, but if we just look at online, offline, what we're saying is between these two channels, the donor gets at most 14 touch points in a year for 80% of small nonprofits. Now, just because your donor gives to a small nonprofit doesn't mean they exist in this small nonprofit world. They exist in the rest of the world like the rest of us, where large nonprofits and for-profit brands and their kids' school and their family are all vying for attention. And this is actually a really, really big challenge for small nonprofits. This is where that capacity problem or challenge really rises up because 14 touch points in a year is going to be very, very, very difficult to build a relationship, to cut through the noise, to actually connect with donors. So again, strategy perhaps is to actually up the volume, particularly for email, so that you have a better chance of actually standing out and connecting with donors. All right, another insight here, recurring giving is valuable for small nonprofits, but possibly underutilized. So again, when we saw uh, this kind of growth trajectory on recurring, which was great, and they, we found that 13% of uh, revenue, online revenue came from recurring. What was interesting is survey respondents said that recurring giving only accounted 4%. So maybe recurring is actually more useful or more beneficial than the nonprofits actually thought. And when we looked at, again, this is real data, when we looked at the average gift by different um, donor types, so a brand new recurring donor, a recaptured recurring donor, so someone who was a donor, went away and then came back as recurring, a retained recurring donor, someone who's given two years in a row, and then the overall average recurring gift, you can see that a $35 a month donor right out of the gate is actually pretty good. That's over 360 bucks a year, right? That's actually pretty high. That's, that's an opportunity right there. So same thing, if you're thinking, how do I use this information? Well, what, what kind of ask do you make? Do you ask for really, really small amounts? How large do you ask? If the average is 35, maybe you have some room to ask for a little bit higher, or at least have that as an option. And then the overall average gift is 42 bucks a month. You know, we're getting close to $500 a month here, which is not insignificant on a per donor basis. There's real opportunity and value here. So we look at donor retention rates. Again, we've seen this in other studies and we wanted to kind of prove it out here. When you look at overall 49%, one-time donors uh, were retained at 42%. Repeat donors, so people who give year over year on a one-time basis for 58%. And look at this, recurring donors were retained at a 92% rate. Again, we see this a lot. And what's interesting in the survey, people said they thought they had a 50% recurring donor retention rate. So they're probably getting more money from recurring donors, and they're definitely retaining recurring donors at a much, much, much higher rate than they think. And this is what's so great, particularly for small nonprofits, when you're strapped for time and resources and energy is... Look at single gift revenue over time and look at recurring gift revenue over time. It compounds month after month, year after year. And this uh, data set, which is from Target Analytics folks, they found that um, recurring donors were worth 10 to 11 times more for small nonprofits compared to large organizations. So recurring is still a massive opportunity. And again, it seems repetitive. We're talking about recurring all the time. But yet, here's what we found. Only 51% of nonprofits, small nonprofits, had a recurring giving program. So something that's kind of focused on recurring giving. So half 
half are just kind of intentionally, or maybe not intentionally, but 50% aren't actually participating and actively trying to recruit recurring donors. So big opportunity perhaps there as well. And then the last key insight here is small nonprofits are less prepared to thank donors and much less prepared to try and win them back if and when they stop giving. So again, on the strategy side, we tried to figure out, you know, uh, do you have a stewardship plan or a thank you plan in place? 31% uh, of small nonprofits said no. So just about a third of small nonprofits don't have any sort of thank you plan or strategy. Won't go into all the benefits of thanking and gratitude and what that means, but it's hugely, hugely important and a lot of small nonprofits aren't doing it. And then the follow-up is, well, what happens if you lose these people? You know, they're incredibly valuable. It's hard to get donors. What if you have one? What happens if they lose them? And only 18% of small nonprofits had a lapse prevention or reactivation plan or strategy or something in the way of how do we stop people from just kind of going about their lives? How do we build this relationship? Or if they haven't given to us, how do we find out ways to kind of get them back? So here's the quick recap on some of those key findings that we've, we found using survey and real data. Uh, small nonprofits aren't generating a lot of traffic to their websites. They send fewer emails to fewer people. A multi-channel strategy is almost non-existent. Recurring giving continues to be incredibly valuable for small nonprofits, but seemingly underutilized. And small nonprofits seem to be less prepared to thank and much less prepared to win back when it comes to their strategy. So again, those are some key findings. You might be like, yawn, you know, I know, what do I actually do? Well, here's a few quick things. And then Kimberly and myself through questions can kind of answer a few more, but uh, small nonprofits tr struggling with traffic, uh, consider getting the Google ad grant. That's something that you could do to boost traffic. And then frequency, posting on Facebook. Uh, we found small nonprofits and large nonprofits post about two to three times a week. That's what the majority said. Maybe you could post a little bit more frequently or figure out how to engage on Facebook. That's normally a good driver of traffic and sending emails more frequently. So what if you're struggling with uh, emails? Or where can you collect emails? Offline, at events, anywhere that you're collecting information, can you try to do a better job at collecting emails? Again, emails aren't valuable just for online giving, but for offline giving. So how can you collect those? And then again, think about instead of the maybe one email a month or the quarterly newsletter, is there a way to maybe break that up and send more frequent emails with a little bit less content? It's a way to stay more fresh in the inbox and kind of communicate more precisely and directly. Maybe that's a strategy. Multi-channel, we kind of went over it, but sending email to offline and offline to email, uh, there seems to be a big opportunity for small nonprofits to try some of that. The easier one, obviously, is sending email to offline donors, which is less cost. It's really just trying to uh, match up some donor records and send emails. Recurring giving, one thing you could try is actually defaulting to recurring uh, on your donation page, so having it be the, the default. Um, a few years ago, we saw that this was kind of a, not a positive strategy, but in the past year and a half or so, we've seen this actually prove uh, a few times to be more beneficial, where no negative impact on the amount of people who make a donation and more people are likely to make a recurring gift. And this is, again, particularly important for small nonprofits, where they're going to be so much more valuable. And if you don't have a thank you or, or a lapse or retention plan, they're even more valuable. And then just, it sounds so simple, but just talking about recurring giving, asking for recurring gifts when you can is actually uh, one of the basic, most simple things you can do. Uh, and then on the thanking side, maybe a welcome series. You know, tools like MailChimp or a lot of email tools will have a pretty easy way to automate things. So if someone makes an online donation or um, uh, someone actually signs up for email, you can create two, three, four emails to make sure that they get thanked and get some information in that first time frame when they're a lot more engaged. And maybe consider using volunteers of saying like, hey, you know, could you come in and help make calls or write notes to some of these donors that are either new or are about to lapse? And a lot of people who are looking for things to do, especially now perhaps, you know, giving them a phone list or send, mailing them some cards that they can mail out or something like that. Maybe that's a volunteer position you could come up with and say, hey, you're the kind of customer service, you know, donor retention wizard and see how you can maybe use someone like that to, to take advantage of their skills and, and uh, reduce your time. So that's some of the key findings, some of the things you can do. Uh, we're gonna have a decent amount of time for questions. So if you wanna chat those in, um, uh, Kimberly and myself and Nathan will be here to answer as many questions as we possibly can. Um, I had a few additional benchmark things that I'm just gonna kind of save for now. Uh, they'll be in the final report and uh, maybe they'll come up in some questions. So while you're typing in your questions, a few things, uh, again, Nathan mentioned, we're doing a workshop tomorrow. Um, so if this wasn't enough of, of Brady and Nathan, you can come get a full dose tomorrow uh, where we're going to go over kind of a lot of how do you do online fundraising based on 
uh, kind of data evidence and research. Uh, if you're like, hey, I don't have time tomorrow, but I'm interested, uh, we have uh, eight online courses you can take, and we created this special code just for you, the code MIGHTY. If you use it before May 31st, you can take any course, normally $299 for just $49. So copywriting or uh, A-B testing or using Facebook, um, any of those courses are available to you until May 31st, $49. Uh, or we're also doing a free trial. So we have, this, we have a membership program where you get some special access to research and resources, some members-only webinars. But you, with your monthly payment, you also get access to any and all of our courses uh, each month. So you can do a free trial if you want a work from home trial. So again, uh, we're going to have questions here. Uh, one person that you haven't heard from and that you will hear from in, as we get into questions and answers is uh, Kimberly. So Kimberly, uh, Kimberly O'Donnell is the Managing Director of Professional Services and Lead Fundraising Coach at Network for Good they focus a lot on how do we actually help small nonprofits do some of these things or interpret their data. Um, and so she's actually on the call. Kimberly, are you there? I am here. Hi, everybody. It's great to be speaking with you today. Um, if you are less familiar with Network for Good, just let me give you a quick overview. Um, Network for Good works with thousands, thousands of small nonprofits to provide what we consider to be simple, smart, and uh, really effective uh, fundraising software. It helps cultivate relationships with donors. It helps small charities raise more funds. And uh, our donor, donor management software includes fundraising pages, texting, video acknowledgements, email campaigns, direct mail pieces, all of that in an all-in-one solution that can help um, organizations fundraise smarter and grow their good faster. Um, if you are also unfamiliar with Network for Good, then you may not know that we've been around since 2001. We pilot um, the donations for Facebook, for Google, for Patagonia, so very large entities. We have processed um, more than $3 billion in donations to date, and we've worked with more than 400,000 nonprofit leaders. On my side, I manage our personal fundraising coach program. And what that is, is one-to-one um, -one professional coaching um, with small nonprofits and uh, professional fundraisers. We're all fundraising experts. I have clients. I've been in the fundraising space for 25 years, like Brady. I've worked at small nonprofits. I've been an executive director um, and our coaches uh, are as well. And so they're accredited and really um, fantastic and being able to provide insight to small organizations on what to do next. Um, you know, so you aren't sending out so many communications. Well, what should those communications say? What should your cadence be? Should it only be through email right now? Or should you combine that with video and text? What do we say around COVID? Um, one of the biggest questions that I hear on almost a daily basis is, should I be fundraising right now? And the answer is yes. <laughs> yes, you cannot stop fundraising during COVID. Doesn't matter if you're an indirect service organization or you're providing direct services during COVID. You need to be raising money right now because this is when people are feeling generous. We will be moving into a period where there's going to be a bit of a slump and you don't wanna be trying to, to raise all of your money during that period of time. Instead, you'll wanna sort of adapt your plan and, and engage your donors, but but you should be um, going after donations right now and doing that through the summer months. Um, I'd like to invite all of you to show your support for small nonprofits by joining our movement, which is uh, hashtag COVID can't stop good. Um, add that hashtag to the communications that you put out on social media. Um, you can also uh, go to our COVID can't stop good webpage and, um, and download uh, a Facebook and uh, Instagram skin that you can put on your profile um, and, uh, and join our COVID Can't Stop Good movement. And then on the, the next slide, just real quick, I wanna invite everybody to join our Nonprofits Unleashed um, Facebook group. Um, this has more than 16,000 members. They're all from different nonprofits across the country and, and world. Um, and you can post questions and really get some really useful insight from this um, wonderful uh, community. Um, we like to unleash generosity. And through this Facebook page, uh, you're able to get some great insights. So that's just a little bit of background on Network for Good, what we do, what resources are available 
available to you. Um, we do tons of webinars. We have a ton of content, white papers, things like that around fundraising for small nonprofits. And it was our interest to partner with Next After to really dive into um, how smaller nonprofits are fundraising right now and what things are working and not working for them. And so hopefully this um, data that come out today and Brady, thanks so much for sharing it. This is my first view at it, um, really has given you some insight into what to do next and how you can better leverage all of the communication tools that exist for you to engage your supporters more effectively and hopefully retain and grow them along the way. Awesome. Well, thanks again, uh, Kimberly and Network for Good for partnering with us uh, on this. I think it's a really, really important subject, and you know, hopefully, this can help uh, you know be another quiver in the air in the another arrow in the quiver for small nonprofits in terms of what they should do. So, I think we have some questions, Nathan, uh, Kimberly, and myself. will stay as, as long as we can to to get some of these questions, either about the research and the data, or you're just like, how do I do this stuff? So, yeah, yeah. Feel free to ask questions about what should I be doing right now. I get those questions every day, all day, guys, and I'd be happy to provide some insight, some fundraising insight for you. Well, we've got a couple questions that are in here uh, so far. I wrote a couple down, too, that we can dive into as well, just have some conversation about uh, if there aren't a ton of other questions. But yeah, again, feel free to pop these in here as we're having a discussion. Um, first question from my friend uh, Sanchi Partida. She's wondering if within this data set, if there's anything really about demographics. Uh, she says specifically, are there demographics age-wise uh, are there exceptions within any of our of, of this research data? Yeah, we had some demographics on the survey side in terms of like uh, male female. Uh, that was one of the, the questions, but um, it, there was more females than males who responded. We didn't think it was a useful, you know, um, slice to look at their responses. Uh, so we didn't really do that. And then on the the giving side, no, we did not get uh, demographic. Uh, information. Network for Good would have some of that perhaps, but that wasn't part of the analysis that we did in terms of male, female, or age. Um, that's another reason for Google Analytics data to be key is you can often get age um, uh, when people make their donations online, but you may not actually get age if you don't use Google Analytics, if you just rely on, on CRM. So no is the short answer in terms of did we look at demographics? No. I don't know if you have anything else to, to add, Kimberly, just more generally, but in the data set, no. No, um, beyond the data set, if you're curious to know about any de demographics related to your donors, um, begin to track, you know, who they are. A, a lot of times small organizations will tell me, I know who my donors are. And so I'll kind of push back to them. Do you really, do you, do you really know who they are? Do you know what their capacity is? Because I hear you asking for the same dollar amount from them over and over again, rather than thinking about how to upgrade them to higher levels or what state in their life they're in right now. Maybe they, a lot of people right now, quite frankly, are working on their estates and you know wills. And so this might be a great time for you to start peppering in language about legacy giving to your organization. Um, around the idea of getting to know who your donors are, once you have a sense of who your donors are and maybe what age range they're in or other demographics they fall into, what I would encourage you to do is step backward and really think about whether or not those donors that you have today are the ones that you wanna to have tomorrow because you can message to them differently and if you are going, if your hope is to start to begin to acquire a younger you know, cohort of donors, then you're going to need to do different types of messaging to them, right? Like if you're in social media and you're in Facebook and that's really where you're promoting your posts and everything, but you want to reach out to people in their 20s or early 30s, they're not necessarily in Facebook. They're in different social media channels and you may want to leverage influencers more and other different types of groups more. So um, that sort of is this, <laughs> Brady, I went a little further than the question for sure, but, um, and Nathan, but what I really want people to start to think about is who are your donors today and who do you want them to be tomorrow? And what does that demographic profile look like? And what should you be doing to begin to nurture those relationships? Because they don't happen overnight, folks. It takes time. That's good. Thank you both so much. That's, that's, yeah, obviously beyond the question, but, but super helpful and insightful. Mm -hmm. Uh, question from Renee. She's wondering if, if uh, you know, for either of you, have you seen a difference in the effectiveness of sending people a handwritten thank you note versus just shooting somebody a quick email to say thank you? Any thoughts there? 
Probably not in Kimberly, go for it. I can, I can jump in on that. The answer is absolutely. Um, personalization does touch people in meaningful ways. And there are multiple ways that you can do that. Um, acknowledgements should not just be a one and done, right? Someone donates online and they get a receipt. A receipt is not a thank you guys. That's not a thank you. So maybe you do have automated receipts that go out, but for anyone who gives over a certain dollar amount, you have a volunteer or board member write a personal thank you. If um, they're a new donor, then maybe they get that personal thank you. As well, if you have new donors or a significant gift comes through um, and you have a video acknowledgement tool, then within 24 hours, shoot them in a, a video saying, oh my gosh, I, we received your gift. I can't believe it. Thank you so much. You do not know how impactful this gift is going to be on our organization. Or shoot them a text message. Remember, what we're saying is that email is very important, and certainly direct mail is too, but there are multiple channels that you can be leveraging today. And guess what? During COVID, people have their eyeballs on these things. So they're actually gonna be very well received. So what I would encourage you to do is create a plan, uh, an acknowledgement plan for the different dollar amounts that come through, who responds to them. I would encourage you to go beyond just the executive director sending all of these and leveraging your board and other volunteers to really touch and communicate, engage your donors and show them the breadth and depth of your organization. I can just add, Two, two things quick. Uh, I did some research recently uh, around thanking um, to see, because this is a big question. There's a lot of stuff that we say or people say, and they're like, well, yeah, does, is there any evidence? So a few things that I found. Um, one, the message is hugely, hugely key. So regardless of if it's a mail, or it's an email, or it's a text, tying the donor's specific impact is, at, is absolutely critical. And it actually is linked to people giving again and being more generous. So saying, you know, your $50 will be put to work to do X, Y, and Z if you can, or give some sort of tangibility to it, it's hugely important. And two, the value of the phone. There's a famous kind of experiment with Penelope Burke and a board member phoning within 48 hours that a lot of us have been saying for years. And so um, the, the folks that, there's a, a study that came out and said, hey, these, uh, we did 600,000 phone calls and uh, that said thanks and didn't make a difference but it was only public radio and it was seven months later. So it was like, well, is that really you know, validating? And so the folks at Bloomerang looked at like 3 million donor interactions and found that yes, if you get a phone call within 90 days to say thanks, it had a significant difference on the likelihood of someone to give again and the speed at which they were to make the second donation. So the phone is possibly another thing um, to, to add to that mix that Kimberly was talking about where we have seen some evidence that yes, that does actually move the needle. And just to make it, you know, drive it home a little bit more, you know, so Network for Goods, simple spark fundraising software designed for small charities. Um, we offer video acknowledgements. In March, we, and we just launched it softly at the end of the year. We're, we're just starting to promote it right now. And, and uh, so in March, we had about 800 video acknowledgements that went out. Then in April, it bumped up to 6,000 video acknowledgements. For May, and May isn't even done yet, and this data came out last week, over 10,000 videos had been sent out by our charities. And um, what's so great about the concept of a video acknowledgement, a thank you, is that people will actually email or send a video text or something back and they'll say thank you so much I've never gotten anything like this before I am moved so um, don't be afraid to try new technologies to appreciate your donors because they'll be delighted by it and that's the thing that you want to be able to do is you want to surprise and delight your donors in ways in which they are receiving communications today not just all the old timey things Cool, thank you both so much. Here's a, uh, just a quick question kind of about how we handled some of the data. Um, specifically, Vicki is wondering uh, how we accounted for organizations, particularly like healthcare type organizations that may have on the surface enormous budgets, but actually just have a small foundation uh, size budget that they're working with for fundraising. Did we account for that in the data set? So on the survey side, it's up to them, right? There's no way for us to validate whether <laughs> they, what they tell us is true or not. So uh, this, that's part of the challenge with survey data is one hospital could have said, here's our revenue from the hospital foundation. And another hospital could have said, here's our revenue from the whole hospital. And we don't know the difference. So again, that's why uh, we didn't spend a lot of time doing vertical analysis or even subsplits via size. 
Uh, we thought there was enough in the $300,000 medium revenue range to make the, the findings pretty ubiquitous for small nonprofits without getting into variability and, and different ways that different organizations get into verticals. So on that side, no. And then on the network for good side, it would also it would also depend on who the organization is. On that side, we were just looking at the revenue that we received. So whether it's a hospital foundation or a hospital, if they're using network for good to process those donations, that's what we received. If the hospital foundation used a different tool than the hospital, then we would only get what network for good received. So it's too convoluted and complicated to say how. Uh, we, we actually did that. So on survey self-selected and on the data side, it's how they're using network for good. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully that's clarifying for, for Vicky. A question from Susan. She's wondering, uh, when someone actually donates online, does that count as permission to email them? Maybe a question for either of you. Kimberly, do you want to take that one first? <laughs> I'm trying to remember the, the, the appropriate language. Um, it depends on how you have worded it. Um, often it is an opt-in then if you've given the gift uh, and they've contributed to you and they've given you that email address. So you can, um, we get questions about texting, you know, like, can they do that? You should always give an opt out. Um, and so then they do have that opportunity, but you, you, my, my understanding is that, um, if you are giving online, then you're opting in and there's some language for it. Yeah, the only caveat would be GDPR, right? So Correct. that's a pretty far reaching piece of legislation. It's making its way into California that could really throw a wrench in things, but that's really specific to people in the Eurozone that doesn't normally apply where you need explicit opt-in. That's pretty convoluted, pretty sophisticated. Generally speaking, yes, uh, fundraising communication, it's, it is a, in, uh, by making a donation, they are intending to opt-in. In Canada, Castle, Spam law doesn't apply to fundraising. It's only if you're selling things, for example. But this is another reason why a welcome series is great. If you have someone who's getting emails that they don't want your emails, let them get off your list right away. It's better for everyone, right? They won't be angry. They won't drag your deliverability down. So that should be part of it is, yes, they can unsubscribe from any email, but even just say, hey, here's the types of communications we'll send. You know, you can unsubscribe at any point. It's part of just, you know, we talk about it being relationally, like treat it more relationally as opposed to legally and, and you'll be better off. And if I could just jump in, the follow-up question that I typically get is, I don't have enough emails, so what do I do? And what we encourage folks to do is um, use a form, if you have an online form capability, and send out a communication, an email to folks asking for updates or include an update um, uh, tear slip or, or sorry, um, a shoot, a buck slip or something in your direct mail piece, asking them for their information, both email and their cell phone. And so that you have that information, you can begin to communicate with them in multiple channels. And if you send out an email that is saying, hey, we're updating our database right now, we would love to have the most current information um, on you. Sure, you're not gonna get 100% response, but whatever you get is freshening your database. And why not do it now during this COVID period when you're likely to catch people? Yeah, and always just be thinking, why would they want to give you the information? Just like, we want your email. That's great. I don't want to give you my email, right? Position things in the way of like, what do I get by giving you my text, my cell phone or my email? We see that all the time when we do our studies. It's like, they're not giving a reason. So of course you want my email. Of course you want my cell phone number. Why should I give that to you? That's something that we always have to be thinking about. Thank you. Here's a question from Tracy. Uh, she's wondering, talking about recurring giving. Brady, you had mentioned... Uh, potentially trying to default to monthly as a giving option. Do we have research around you know, that type of a strategy or tactic? Yeah, yeah, there's quite a bit now, which is great. Um, this was a strategy that a lot of the, the large organizations, particularly in public media and environment have been using for years is defaulting into a monthly. And um, a couple of things that, that we've learned when you default to monthly, like one, there's a little bit of like, um, you know, consumer wind blowing in your favor where we purchase a lot more things via subscription. So people are a lot more interested, likely, and willing to make recurring gifts. Um, we've seen the trend where more people are likely to sign up online for a recurring gift than ever before. So there's more people doing it. Um, so what we have learned is like um, by defaulting in, there still needs to be a, a value proposition or a reason again, not just like give monthly, like why should you give monthly? Like why should you give and why is monthly specifically important? Because the value proposition is basically less out of your wallet today and each day and you'll make a bigger impact over time like 
that's a very strong value proposition. So it's pretty easy to talk about the benefit of monthly. Um, what we have seen is if you're um, kind of like too controlling and it's like a, even a, a checkbox that's pre-checked, we've seen that actually sometimes have a negative impact as opposed to something that's more subtle, like a, a tab layout where there's monthly and it's open to monthly. And then you can always choose one time. When we're trying to nudge people, if we're too aggressive, sometimes it can have the opposite effect. So that's a pretty nuanced thing, but the, the idea is always, how do we nudge with value? And that would be that. And then another thing is actually starting at a lower donation amount. We've seen that have no difference on conversion rate or average gift. Because um, the psychology is someone's like, yeah, I wanna make a monthly gift. And if the first thing they see is 35, which we saw was for new, they might go, whew, 35, that's a lot, I can't do it. Whereas if you start with something like 10 and then go to 35, they go 10, yeah, I could do, you know what? I think I could do 35. There's this idea of small yeses and cognitive momentum. So think about starting with a lower amount and then try to nudge towards a higher amount. Those are some of the things that we do have research and experiment. Uh, and if I, show that that if, works. if I could just add to that, um, we at Network for Good call it subscription giving because it is just like you know all the other subscriptions that you're, you're purchasing. Um, we are actually doing a pilot program with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation on subscription giving where we are we have coaches that are working one-on-one -on -one with a cohort of small nonprofits uh, each month um, to help drive uh, and increase subscription-based giving. And we're seeing our preliminary results now five months into the pilot is are really strong. We're seeing double to triple the number of recurring donors coming on board with them. So, um, so do you know consider asking for those subscription-based gifts? Um, and remember, every time you ask for somebody to give, you're inviting them to give. You're not, you know, making the decision for them about when they should or should not give. People care about your cause year-round but they don't always give to you year round because no one has asked them to. So invite them to give to you on a year round basis so they, make, so they can make more of an impact on your mission and then communicate with them how that impact is being made just like Brady said. Great, well, thank you both. Um, looking through here, it looks like maybe we have one more question uh, and that's Vicky trying to understand exactly what the, and you kind of said this at the beginning, but what's the delineation between a small nonprofit and a large nonprofit within this data set? Yeah, so for us, it was a million dollars total revenue. That's what our definition of a small nonprofit was. If it was less than a million dollars in total revenue, we consider it to be small. If it was more than a million, we considered it to be big. And now again, even within that cap, uh, even within that bucket of a million, there's a lot of different ways you could slice it. Right, the, the majority of organizations were under $300,000 that were in this data set. So there's probably, you know, if we do this again in the future, I think what would be, you know, interesting is to maybe even go within small, maybe we have, you know, would not patronizing terms, but like, you know, very small and, and larger, small or whatever the names will be, but growing. I think there could be <laughs> growing, there you go, growing startup. Charities. <laughs> I, I think if, if we were able to, and we don't have time, it was not part of the scope, but if you could split 500,000 and above and 500,000 and below, I'm sure we would see some different responses as well within that. So that's kind of uh, something that I think we'll be looking at into the future. Cool. And I have, so one more question, uh, I'll give you both a chance to respond to it, uh, which is we've talked a little bit about like, it can be confusing of trying to figure out where to actually start. There's so much data, there's so many opportunities, it appears, we're talking about recurring giving, talking about retention, purely just like improving your donation page, how do you get, there's like so many things. Uh, Kimberly, do you have any thoughts as to where should someone really start today? If you're gonna start focusing on one thing, where, where should that be? Right, right. Um, so, so first of all, what I usually recommend that people do is I ask them to think about what their strengths are. As a fundraiser, what are you really good at? Okay, if that's it, whatever it is, um, bringing on new donors or appreciating your donors or you know maybe it's major gifts, whatever. Lean into that initially um, and begin to create a cadence. Set a set time on your calendar every single week, at least an hour, I would encourage at least two, every single week, set time on your calendar to focus on fundraising. Know what you're good at, know where you're struggling and begin to break those things out. 
try something new every two weeks or so, you know, push it out there. Um, and, and, you know, think long-term about what area of your fundraising you truly want to grow because you can't do it all, right? So then you figure out what you're good at, figure out what you want to grow, and then you dedicate time to do it on a regular basis. Because if you're starting and stopping because you have so many other things to do, you're not going to make the progress that you need. Fundraising is like going to the gym. You have to work out to get a great body, a summer bod. You have to dedicate time to fundraise to have the return on the investment that you want long term. That's I good. could go on and on, but those are sort of that's like where I would have somebody initially start. Yeah, I was just I will. pausing because you talked about summer bod, and I got I got the COVID bod going on. Um, <laughs> two things: one, I I have yet to come across an organization that could not benefit from focusing on recurring giving more. I just I don't. I don't know why we don't focus more on subscription giving, recurring giving, monthly giving. Uh, just every piece of data and evidence says this is really, really important today and tomorrow. So that's one big one. And then the other one is uh, communications. Um, you know, we talk a lot about fundraising, but really driving value is about our communications. And so the thing that I also have found very, very few organizations of saying send, send more. I'm not saying go from two to 200, but if you send 12 emails, try sending 14, 16. If you send two letters, try sending four letters. Um, there's a cost benefit analysis in there, but communications is really what drives relationships from a distance and what drives action and conversions. And uh, that's generally what's really, really important is so uh, I think almost every organization can improve communications. Again, huge asterisks, they need to be good communications, but uh, we can always communicate a little bit better and a little bit more than I think we can. Well, and, and also just so that everybody remembers, we've got you back. Like we know how hard it is to be a small organization doing all of this on your own um, and having to come up with new ideas. Um, but there are a lot of great tools out there. Um, there's a lot of great advice. You made a big step today by being part of this webinar, right? You're really interested in what you should be doing next. And um, all of us behind the scenes are high-fiving you you know, because you're really looking forward and kudos to you for that. And I know we all wish you the best of luck. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Kimberly, Brady, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for both sharing today. Um, super grateful for, for you both and the time and effort that's been invested in this study to really help people you know, find new ways to grow. So to all of you listening and tuning in, thank you so much for spending an hour and 15, 17 minutes with us <laughs> uh, to, yeah, find new ways to, to grow. Best of luck to you. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next time.